you know, that's the first thing somebody asked me when they see you work with Fletcher Fletcher. Yeah, you gonna do the whole album? No. And I'm like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> but that's what they think they want me to do the whole record. Because it, because it becomes more of an experience then. The Chronic was an experience. It wasn't an album, it was an experience. Because Dr. Dre did the whole thing. That was life changing. That was a life changing record. Life changing record. I can talk all day. You inspired me over here. I didn't say nothing. I'm not going to talk about it. Right. You know what I mean? Talk about you want to work with them. Has it been hard to kind of track him down? You know, just in years? Uh, me and my man. This is Woody from LRG, y'all. Oh, peace. What up, y'all? Good friend of mine. Yeah, we just had this conversation in the car. Um, We've been trying to figure out that Nas is an anomaly, man. Like, he's just, he's just, you know. He wants to get a, so far away from Illmatic and everybody wants him to go back. And I think we want, he think, I think he thinks that we're thinking about his, we're talking about his subject matter. But we're mostly talking about the sound. Like, you know, Nas is one of the few artists from my generation that's keeping our generation alive. On a mainstream standpoint, we can talk about Slope Terrain all day. But from a mainstream standpoint, it's Nas, Jay, it's not too many of us, but them that's left. And so, you know, I spoke with him. I played beat. Well, I was actually in Atlanta when I, I first played beats for Nas this past year. Well, earlier this year. I played beats for him. You know, first time. He picked some. It's a waiting game, you know? Like, it's a waiting game with any artist I work with. You know, I can send artists. I can make beats for artists. Unless they specifically come down and say, I want to do records with you and come to my studio. It's always a waiting game. So a lot of people say, when you going to work with that? It's not when I'm going to work with this person. It's when they're going to work with me. So Nas is Nas tough cookie, man. Tough cookie to get to. Other questions? Um, who are some of your influences? Man, you see, you know, the, the usual is um, P-Rock Premier, um, the Beat Miners, the Beat Nuts. Organized Noise, The Bomb Squad, Molly Mall, Diamond D, Fuck Wild, uh, uh, DJ Scratch, anybody who, any, uh, Tony Dope, I mean, we do this all day long. Okay. It, anybody who was the soundscape makers in the early 90s. Yeah. Right. Well, so I specifically ask that question. Um, I'm with Soul Aesthetic and Brave Music. We're doing a documentary on Jay Dilla and Lupus. And so we just want to get people talking about Jay Dilla's influence on them or just influence on the game in general. Jay Dilla, Jay Dilla was probably the most prolific beat maker that has ever lived because his beat output was incredible. I, I never got a chance to meet him, you know, but his beat output, I mean, I always meet somebody on the street that say, I got like 500 Dilla beats, you ain't got it. And telling the truth, right? That's the thing about Dilla that's so fascinating. A lot of people don't understand that, you know, a lot of that shining record, a lot of those records he was doing, laying in the bed in the hospital, sick, with an MP laying on his chip. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like he was meant to, and meant and to, to live and die making beats. And so, Dilla really is the father of the quote unquote neo soul movement. You gonna tell the truth about it? He's really the father of that whole soundscape of music, using claps, early snares, all of that stuff. That's that's Dilla. That's Dilla. I could tell you study a lot. So you know, how does that for aspiring producers? What what would you rate like? How what to study and how to study? When I when I first started making beats. Um, well, I was, I was, I've always been a fan of hip-hop, right, since in 82. So, um, but when you start to become or want to become a producer, and it goes from listening to casually listening to it around in the car. I mean, you as a kid, you know, my friends told me all the time that I heard stuff. You used to hear stuff music we didn't hear, right? But when you start to make beats, now you have to go back and listen and start studying music again, like, you know, it took me for the longest time to understand that, okay, 
in electric relaxation, Five Dog never raps over the sample. He just raps over the bass line. You would know that if you would study it and straighten it out. There is no snare. Pete Rock used no snare and snare straighten it out. He just used a little whatever that sound was that was in the actual sample. So it's you have to go back and study. You have to. Like I was telling him earlier, you have to be, if you want to be in this, you have to be an expert, man. Like, you have to be an expert in what you want to be in. You have to. If a new record comes out, know who produced it. If it's dope, who produced it. Know everything about the dude. This, that, and the third. It's, that's, that's what's up. You got to know records. You got to know old 70s producers and all type of stuff, man. You know, it, it, it's funny to me when other races and other cultures and whatever say that hip hop is a dumb culture. And we don't want, man, it, you know, the whole production aspect of it and digging for records kills that whole, just kills it. Because if you don't know anything about it, you'll be completely lost. The study of Wu Tang Clan will completely lose you if you've never heard Wu Tang Clan. Completely. With different names and, and all of that, and how they inf Food, uh, infused uh, the Kung Fu culture and all of that and you know 5% of it you'll be lost if you never heard hip hop before so you just gotta you gotta be in this man like you it's really this is really a fraternity man this is really this is like if you're, if you're any fraternity sorority members in anybody if you're a fraternity sorority member if you you don't know your stuff they snatch your shirt off and that's how I feel sometimes when I see some of these cats you don't know what what you mean, nigga? I don't know what LL is. What you, what you, what you want to rap, nigga? <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and that's, that's what kind of gets under my skin, but you just got to be expert, or at least want to learn more about what you want to become a part of. Some people seem to have this, this uh, mentality that these cats, and these cats, that some of these cats you're talking about, they just don't have a love for hip hop, mm -hmm. or the culture, or the mm -hmm. history behind it, or some education. They, they don't see anything wrong with them turning into a hustle, trying to get money, or they don't, they don't see what effect that has. Do you think they're wrong? But not, do you think they just don't understand hip-hop either? That's why you see it that way? You can look at it in so many different ways. I think everybody's put on this uh, put on this planet for different reasons, different purposes. Everybody ain't supposed to leave. There's some people that's supposed to follow. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, that's just, the, that's just the natural signs of life, man. So... But the ones we look at and kind of, you know, say, oh, like you're embarrassing us, this, that, and the third, or whatever, or whatever we want to say, do this, that, you know. One, we don't understand where they came from. That may be all they know. But I don't expect that person to lead me. Or, you know, I just don't mean, if this, if, if this is what you are, then this is what I expect. Some people can't, in order to, to do exactly what you're talking about, know the history, know the culture, know this, that, and the third, and to be, stand up straight when it comes to the name of hip-hop, man, that's a hard responsibility to carry. A lot of niggas don't want to carry it. They just don't. Do you think it's a hard responsibility for you to carry, or do you think it's just in you to do that? Like that? I mean, sometimes it's in, but it's, it, it, sometimes it's tough. I mean, it can get tough because... You know, you look at TV and see the people that, or look on magazines and see that this is what America thinks hip-hop is. And in order for me to get to that level, that I'm on an ebony or something like that, then I'm going to have to do something that I don't want to do, to be very candid about it. I, I'm going to have to do something, try to, you know, i just rather make it on my own terms instead of doing something that is, is so totally against what I believe in. So that means that everybody is not to, everybody is meant to not I mean, not meant to lead. And some people just meant to follow. We just have to leave them what they had. Period. If you could change anything about hip hop as it stands today, what would that be? Well, if I could change anything about about hip hop, the one thing I would change is the way the lack of black support. Right. The lack of our people continue to let other people come in and take what we started. That's the and it happened to jazz. Right? 
um, even from an education standpoint, we had the hardest time keeping that class at North Carolina Central. But Duke opened up uh, open arms for it, right? I, I get more lecture opportunities at Ivy League schools than I do at black schools. And we got 11 black schools in the state of North Carolina. The way the media has formed hip hop to separate the generations is amazing. Like you can't even get a 60 year old, 70 year old, 50 year old to even want to listen to Eric B and Rakim. Although he's, he's kicking the real, you can't even get because they ah oh, that's that old, that's that, that's that. They don't even want to listen because all they see is BET, right? So they don't even, the media has separated the generations because of what the picture they painted for hip hop music. And that makes black people not want to support it. That makes black people not want to learn anything about it. And that makes other races come in and scoop it right on up, claim it to be theirs, and put the National Archives of Hip Hop at Harvard University. That's the one thing I would change. To, to for black people to understand the beauty, the beautiful thing that we created. That's one thing I would change. How would you go about changing that? Shoot, change you, man. You, <laughs> <laughs> that's just a small that changing is a small microcosm. You know that that turns into not even a hip hop conversation. It just turns into a black society conversation. Mm -hmm. Like that's a small micro, microcosm of what black people need to do. Very small, and the big pantheon of stuff that we need to do that we want and we haven't for the past, woo, man, we'd be all night. But, you know, it's just, we just got to do it one at a time, man. I think putting it in academia would change it. Talking to getting our, old, our elders, because I, I, Jeff Johnson's a good friend of mine, one thing he said in a panel, and he said, we got old people and we got elders. There's a difference. Getting our elders, getting our old people, to understand what time it is. Roy, Roy Ayers is an elder. He knows what time it is to come to hip hop. Your average old person, they just old and mad about it. Nah, I don't want to hear that. That's that noise, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, this same noise is the same person that taught me about Carter G. Woodson. I sure didn't learn about it in elementary school. The only people I learned about was King and, and Tubman and maybe Malcolm X. Maybe. But Chuck D taught me about Carter G, and I didn't know who Steve Biko was. Never heard of Steve Biko until it was on Midnight Marauders. So the same music that you curse gave me a black history lesson every day in my room. And that's, and that's the thing, the old people from that, you don't know what we went through, you don't know what, you know what, I don't, but Chuck D told me all about it. And I can't even get you to understand that. That's the biggest problem we got. So if we get it in, academia and change these old cast minds, then we'll be straight. That's going to take some work from it. And it don't help when we got people on there out there that sound like they can't even read when they rap. I'm saying no names. <laughs> 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 you know. I'm sorry, I don't want to. Yeah, you're right. Um, I'm not lying, but you said the academia. I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. Do you think, because um, you kind of brought, brought a parallel between black history and, and hip hop and academia, like, do you think it's very important to fuse those two? Um, I guess. And Black History Academy? Black History Academy and Hip Hop. Uh, that, when I taught the class in North Carolina Central, I taught the class from April 4th, 1968 to March 9th, mm. 1997. The day King got assassinated, the day Biggie died. That's what I did. Wow. And, and, and the reason why I did it is because if you really look at it, especially in high school, even sometimes college, man, after, after King died, you really don't hear a lot about Black history. You go from King to Obama. Hmm. Like you jump. Like you don't hear nothing that happened in the 70s, Fred Hampton, none of that stuff. You don't hear that. So what I did and what well, well, playing I did in, in the class was, okay, how can we get a generation of kids who don't care, who don't, who don't even understand why they go to a black school? Some of them, you don't even understand why they go to a black school. The legacy going to a black school. So how can we get a generation of kids to listen to what we have to say about hip hop and also throw parts of, you know, you got to put pills in applesauce sometimes. 
So we, you know, that's what we did. So, you know, I was like, all right. You know, such and such cool her, you know, did $100 parties. You know, he's a DJ, did $100 parties in the Autobahn Ballroom. What's significant about the Autobahn Ballroom? So Michael Max got killed. Like, you got to kind of slide it in. And that's what, you know, we talk about Reaganomics. All of that stuff when it came to hip hop, and you know, can I kind of give him a fear? Like, well, did you know that they New York City uh, public school system? They took all the money out of arts program for schools, but they spent twelve million dollars on dogs to put them in by the subway so kids won't paint on the wall. So you don't, you don't want to paint in schools, but when they go graffiti on the subway, you gonna spend twelve million dollars in dogs, right? So. You know, you got one kid again, yeah, man, that's messed up, man. That's how you got to do. You got you to move them like that. And so that's what we did for the class all the way up until the day Biggie died. So that's the way you can kind of tie it. I mean, it's been done before. Spike Lee did it. Different World did it. When they have Dwayne Wayne on the screen or whatever, and you hear Eric B. and Rakim in the background, they did it the same way. It was subliminal. You know what I'm saying? I mean, despite he's been doing that for years, they have a soundtrack with all these hip hop artists, and then they have a jazz joint at the end. They kind of so say, "Who is Stanley Clark? Or who is Bradford Marcellus? I never, I never heard of these cats, but he got it right before the daylight." Yeah, what's up? Despite he's a genius, man, <laughs> he's a genius. So that's how, that's how, that's the way you can do it. Pretty much. Have you ever found yourself in a compromising position? as a producer as far as it being a conflict of interest between the lyricists and what the lyricists, the direction they may be going in as far as your way of thinking? As far as uh, song content? Mm -hmm. Nah, because um, my thing is I don't knock nobody for wanting to tell their story. You just sound like you can read telling it. Period. Like, everybody like to get on Rick Ross, Rick Ross, Rick Ross, Rick Ross, Rick Ross. He up there. He is. It made everybody a rap line. Everybody. Everybody lie. Even the ones that say, I'm for the culture and power to the people, they, them rappers lie to. You see, some of them would, you know, power to the people. I got a library. Ain't got somebody on their arm and ain't even their color. Right? So, I, you know, it's all about the flow pattern and the lyricism. And can you tell your story and make me believe your and sound believable. You know what I'm saying? I mean, perfect example of that is Mob Deep. The infamous is a classic record. Right? You know, but it was some it was murder death kill on that album. Murder death kill, sex, drugs, murder death. I mean that first three albums was infamous, hell on earth, murder music. That's their first three records. And we like to jump up and down on Rick Ross. Leave that man alone, man. That man put out the most incredible music right now that we need for him to put out because the, two, the truth be told, Maybach Music 3, Super High, like those records, they help cats like me because that puts music like that in the mainstream to make a 12-year-old say, God, this sounds good. So when all everybody else start making music that sounds like that, it helps us out, right? So I don't have any problem with any rapper want to tell their story, man. No, no matter what you want to tell it, you from the hood, tell it. If you want to, you know, you light up trees and burn incense, tell it. But be able to do it in a skillful manner, telling it. I like. It. Murder, death, kill, rap. I like that rap. I don't think, I don't think you know it's just, you know suitable for all children to hear, right? But I mean, you know, that's a part of hip hop too. There's a heaven and a hell. That's a, that's a part of hip hop too. I like that man. You know, my prodigy. I don't want him to talk about nothing else but smoking somebody. <laughs> do you? Do, any, do anybody want? No. Did prodigy do a love album? <laughs> No? <laughs> I don't want him to do nothing else. I want him to kill 50 people on his album. <laughs> that, that make, that's prodigy. That's what he does, man. But, you know, make kids, all kids don't need to hear that, but the point of the matter is, man, 
I just I like great lyricism. As long as you ain't talk about anything satanic, we good. You know, I like great lyricism, and I like people to tell their story. Period. So I don't have that much big of a conflict. Yeah. I mean, that's entrepreneurship at its finest. You keep all your money. Like, that's the thing that Kathleen knows down by country. We got college dropout, graduation, and late registration. Let's talk about those three albums. And from a publishing standpoint, he's keeping the whole song sometimes. The publisher. I'm a rap. That's what Kanye, that's what Kanye did. A lot of times, man, Kanye was a, he was a rapper first. And he's like, man, Charging on the muscles, the beast. I gotta learn how to make my own beats, and that's what he did. So, I think it's small for J. Cole. That ain't no different than what Eric Sermon did, David Bowie did, Dilla did. Dilla was the king. Dilla was the best rapper in Slum Village. If you want to tell, I'm sorry, they my boys. Dilla was the best rapper in Slum Village. I'm talking about slums. Cody Gall and Slum Okay, okay. You know, and he was the best rapper in Slum Village. And so, you know, it's this it's entrepreneurship, man. Ain't nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with it at all. And I don't think it hurts the rest of us. There's plenty of artists out there that you can get beats to. Plenty. They can't make beats. Making beat making beats and making being great at it is hard to do. So it ain't too many of us out there. How do you feel about, like, I mean, if you heard Big Crit and J. Cole, mm -hmm. how do you feel about their skills in the production? I think it's dope. Crit can make beats. Crit is dope. Ooh. Like, he's, Crit is one of those ones that I was talking about, like, this 23 years old from Mississippi, man. All he want to know is about crazy. And you never would think that if he comes from Mississippi, but, you know, everybody kind of forget that. At one point and another, in 93, everybody across the nation was listening to black movies. This whole Dirty South thing started in 96 from a national, national standpoint when, when Goody Mob coined the phrase Dirty South to the world. And before that, man, everybody was on the same thing. I mean, you had your different pockets here and there, but for the most part, you know, New York invaded everybody. So, I mean, Crit is just a byproduct of that. I think that's what we messed up. Hip hop ain't for everybody. We try to make it for everybody, make it this mainstream global. I don't really want a 55. No offense, I don't really want a 55 year old white woman to like my music. <laughs> I don't care. You don't like my jams? I don't care. And I think that's where that that comes from a from the 60s. And that word is called assimilation. Assimilate to, you know, we want to go in the white bathroom instead of the black bathroom. Right? What happens when the black bathroom is the coolest bathroom? Amen. So that's that's what I feel about when some people ask me about hip hop. You want to ask about hip hop from a you want to actually learn about it, this, that, and the third. And I've got some, but I've got some that's like expect me to justify it to them. No. I'm not justifying nothing to you. Especially when your son like this want an autograph for me. Crazy. So that's you know that's what it is. So you got um did you get a chance to see the 
Yeah, I'm hoping to, I hope and do could do that, man, because we the largest you stream the largest you stream um total that Duke ever had was hundred and fifteen views. They did something on campus on you stream, hundred and fifteen unique views. That means hundred and fifteen people. Just hundred and fifteen. Just hundred and fifteen unique views. Exactly. It was crying on the jam, right? Um well, we did the we did the um the Illmatic class. The two and a half hour Illmatic classes, myself, Dr. James Peterson, and Dr. Mark Anthony Neal, we had 20,000 unique views. So, at the end of the day, you know, they have a knack for knowing what hip hop is, but they also want to put butts, butts in the seats, that's, that's the college term. Put some butts in the seats and get, you know, tuition. So, uh, uh, online courses coming. I get that question from so many people, man, you know, adults. Hey, can I just sit at home and take your class? This is a, this is a lot. Hip hop music, man, is a is a big part of people's lives. Some people don't even realize it. until they hear somebody up and talking about. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I remember that. They really don't know how much it influenced their whole way of life. Sometimes I don't really I ain't I ain't hip hop. I'm not really into hip hop. But I say, yo, what you doing now? I'm just chilling. What that mean? Where you get that from? <laughs> Made that up like that. It come. You, that came from. Our generation, that came from our hip hop culture. We made that word up. You think people like I was blessed because my father was actually the person who brought me my first Snoop Dogg album. How old are you? Notorious B. I'm 25. My pops is like uh, 51 now. Mm -hmm. Right. So he brought me my first, you know, B.I.G. Time to go home. He was like the rich mom for the rest of this. He's 51. Yeah. So that means he's 31. Oh, from 1990. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. He was listening to all that, man. He had to know. I remember him having to know about Nature on Blast and the car constantly. Own it. You know, he, was, he was there, man. Like, he, he still asked me to make tapes for him. He asked me to um, make different make tapes for him. To keep him keeping what's going on. Right, right. That's what that's what's saving the next generation, really, is, you know, this is the first generation you're going to see uh, what we call hip hop parents. This is the first generation of hip-hop parents. All the children of hip-hop in the 80s are now becoming parents. So what do you think our kids are going to be listening to? It's like, my nine-year-old, when she turned seven, she had a birthday party. And I'm like, okay. All right, sit down. I want to make a playlist. Okay. So what do you want to hear on your playlist? So she so she starts off with uh, Let's Rock by Chris and Michelle. And I can tell what she's in the car listening to with me. Or what she's in the car with her mama listening or my wife listening to, right? So, Chrisette Michelle, Rihanna Umbrella, she was said about two years ago. Um, and then she goes, let's go crazy my friends. Okay. And then she got the boy, she started singing songs. Don't know the name. I want a girl that's in the hair, a girl from earrings and these two. A runaway girl, right? Like stuff like that. So the we what we do, fuck the down where like she just singing songs, right? And and like you just look at the list, it's got new edition. Let's blue the night by Earth Wind and Fire. All this stuff is on this list and it's more stuff from my generation than it is from hers. Like she don't know. If I say if I say Walker Flocker, she just has no idea. If I say Gucci Mane, she don't know. She don't know. She knows Drake because of me. She don't know the mother mm -hmm. No. It's Michael Jackson every day in the car. I wanna hear I wanna hear blaming on the book. <laughs> so that's you know, I see where you get that from. Alright, we can keep doing questions, but let's let's switch this the space up a little bit and bring you out of the